Do you or someone you love wish you had a better job? Want to be happier on your current job? Don't even have a job? Welcome to Work with Marty Nemco. In recent months, Arkansas and Michigan, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, they've all raised the minimum wage. And the federal government is considering doing the very same thing nationwide. Is that cause for celebration? The question revolves around whether increasing the minimum wage will ultimately put more money in poor people's pockets or whether it will lead so many employers to eliminate, automate, or offshore those positions that it will greatly increase the number of poor people who would be earning zero. Arguing that the minimum wage should be raised, that that will benefit low-income people, is Jared Bernstein. He is the director, or a director, at the Economic Policy Institute, which is a liberal D.C. think tank. He was deputy chief economist for the U.S. Department of Labor during the Clinton administration, and he's the author of a new book, All Together Now, Common Sense for a Fair Economy. Uh, Jared, welcome. Thank you, Marty. And now I'd like to introduce my other uh, protagonist here. He is um, going to argue that raising the minimum wage would ultimately hurt the poor. And he is Walter Block. He is adjunct scholar at he was adjunct scholar at uh, Stanford's conservative Hoover Institution. Currently a scholar at the Mises in the Mises Institute and holder of the Harold Worth Eminent Scholar Endowed Chair in Economics at Loyola University in New Orleans. And both of my guests have written very widely on the minimum wage issue. Indeed, I really believe that unlike I've seen so many debates where they have a straw man, have one really strong candidate on one side of the issue and a you know a straw man candidate on the other, I think these two gentlemen are the most expert persons in America on their side of the issue. So I am most pleased to welcome you both, Jared Bernstein, and of course you, Walter Block. Good to be here, Marty. Good. Let's let's start with you, Walter. Come, and I'm going to give you 60 seconds to answer each question, and um, and then we'll have the other person respond, also having 60 seconds, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, Walter, common sense would suggest that if you raise the minimum wage, poor people would get more money. I mean, you believe, however, that that common sense turns out to be wrong. Explain why. Well, we have such a thing called in economics a downward sloping demand curve. And uh, this is true for peas and carrots and gas and cigarettes. Indeed, some people are very happy that uh, gas prices are higher, the left-wing environmentalists, because they think people will have less gas. Well, if it's true for gas and cigarettes and everything else under the sun, why wouldn't it also be true for labor? Surely, if you raise the price of labor, which is wages, uh, employers will want fewer workers. Another point is that if the minimum wage law is so great, why be so niggardly? Why raise it from 515 to what, 6, 7, 8, whatever, 10... Why not raise it to, oh, 10000 an hour? Then everybody would be, would be very rich. Uh, this is preposterous. That's not the way it works. You see, a lot of people think that the, what's going on here is that the minimum wage is a floor under wages, and that as you raise the floor, wages get higher. No, no, no. If that were true, then 10000 an hour would be great. Rather, the minimum wage is like a hurdle over which you have to jump, and the higher it is, the harder it is to get a job. Okay. Uh, you obviously, Jared Bernstein, do not agree. What is your response to uh, Walter's statement? Well, I agree with Walter's theoretical argument, but in economics, it's not merely uh, the hardest science in the book in terms of whether your theories can simply be accepted based on the, I think, very... Uh, uh, clear logic that Walter has just presented. Um, if you raise the price of something, you might expect people would buy less. Unfortunately, we see this law broken every day. By the way, the, pr the increase in the price of gas really hasn't done much so far to dampen demand for gas. There's something called an elasticity that I'm sure we'll discuss in the course of our conversation. The point is to really get to the bottom of this issue, and I, I bet we talk about this a lot in our time together. You have to look at the empirical evidence of what happened when you raised the minimum wage. If you could simply base your judgment on Walter's simple theoretical model, discussion over. You'd never have to engage in any kind of public policy debate because you could just look at your supply and demand curves and you would know the answer. In fact, you can't have any clue 
I'll let the answer to this question until you go into the data and you see what happens when you raise the minimum wage. Okay, that's now, 60 I seconds. I totally grant you, if you raise the minimum wage to $10,000, you'll okay. have huge disemployment effects and you'll throw a large wrench in the economy. That's, um, you know, an over-the-top uh, uh, example, of course. Uh, let's stop. So let's turn now to, to that very question of the empirical evidence. There is often a, a, a big gap, a big lacuna between the theoretical and the empirical. Uh, Walter Block, what is your empirical evidence that, in fact, that raising the minimum wage would result in uh, in vast unemployment among the the low low wage earners? Well, I agree with Jared about one thing when he said discussion over. I really think the discussion is over. I, I think it's just silly, and it's not really a matter of empirical evidence. Uh, to me, the minimum wage law uh, affecting negatively unemployed or uh, low productivity people is sort of like the Pythagorean theorem in in. Um, uh, geometry. It might be difficult to understand, but it's an uh, absolute dead cert. It's an apodictic necessity that it be this way. <laughs> now, uh, okay, uh, I, I'm going to let him finish the 60 no, seconds, ahead, then you're going to have a chance to respond. <laughs> Uh, with regard to um, empirical evidence, uh, Jared has some sort of a point here, however. Uh, one of the highest percentage increases in the minimum wage law was in I don't know, 1947 or so. I don't remember the exact year. It went from 40 to 75 cents, practically a doubling. And at the time it was 40 cents, all elevators were manually operated. Well, how many people lost their job the next day? Not a one. So it looks pretty good. And here, uh, Jared's point about elasticity is very, um, uh, very correct. And I'm out of time, so I can't go any further. Okay. Talk to me, Jared, talk to us about your view of what the empirical okay. evidence suggests well, about I mean, the raising the minimum. Well, uh, with, with due respect to Walter, he's obviously a very knowledgeable guy about this stuff. I, I find in his response one of the biggest problems in economics today, which is essentially conclusion by assumption. Uh, gravity uh, uh, flows down the demand curve, and ergo, an increase in the price of something has to reduce demand. I'm mean, sure Walter, I'm not in the studio, but I'll bet he's shaking his head yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, uh, so often in, uh, in economics, you really have to test the impact of these changes to see what happens. When we have raised the minimum wage, the, the 96, 97 increase in the minimum wage to take something that's much more current than the 1940s example, although I would like to address that later, is case in point. When we raised the minimum wage in 96, 97 from 425 to 515, uh, uh, folks of Walter's ilk argued that this would be a disaster. In fact, what followed was the strongest low wage labor Labor market we'd seen in decades, uh, with employment and opportunity, employment and earnings opportunities for low-wage workers that far exceeded those that had preceded this increase. Now, I am by no means saying that the increase in the minimum wage was responsible for that, but neither did it preclude it. It's the macro economy that determines job availability. A reasonable, moderate increase in the minimum wage simply helps low-wage earners get a, a more fair slice of the pie. Okay, time. Um, I want to turn to you, Walter, on this. Um, I am not an economist, and I am merely some guy. We, you and I did have a set of email exchanges around the minimum wage issue. We kind of had this little debate ourselves off, you know, on email. And I came up, you, you challenged me. You said, come up with what your model is for how um, wages, you know, what would happen if, uh, if, wage, if the minimum wage were increased. And I came up with this model. I went and expanded it a little bit more. And I'm going to take the liberty of taking a minute or two to lay out the, this model of what I, what I think the factors would be leading to there being no increase in unemployment if we, in fact, raise the minimum wage. And then I'd like you to respond to it, and then I'd like Jared, the expert, to, uh, who's similarly taking my position, to respond. It seems to me that there will be a minimum negative effect. There, there will be very little decrease in uh, employment among low-wage workers if we raise the minimum wage even to eight or nine dollars an hour let alone the proposed 725 for the following eight reasons one it is very expensive to fire people there's the cost of severance there's the cost of lawsuit risk and very expensive to recruit hire and train new people point two most employers are sim even at if we raise the minimum wage two or three dollars an hour would still make a large a significant profit on the worker such that it wouldn't justify that uh, that cost of firing and retraining. Three, employers are human beings too. They feel a certain guilt about, in ma many cases, employers making a heck of a lot more money than their minimum wage workers. So the extra two dollars an hour for somebody who's currently making five fifteen an hour would improve that employee's life significantly. 
while two dollars less for the typical employer, the boss or a corporate owner, will have minimal negative effect on his life. Or if it's a public company, it'll have minimum negative effect on shareholders. I mean, for example, and I don't mean to top myself as, you know, holier than now, but I have many more clients than I have time to see. So I could theoretically raise my rates significantly. But I make enough money, and I feel like putting that money to, in more money to my savings account and taking it away from my poor job seekers, it's not worth doing. I could also, I could pay my assistant less than I do. But it wouldn't feel, and she wouldn't quit. And that wouldn't feel right. And I expect that many other employers feel the same way. They're not just theoretically looking to make maximized profit at every every turn, although the media likes it makes us think that way. I also think there is a human lo loyalty, number four, to that employers, many, not all, but many employers feel to their employees. Five, if a boss fired a bunch of people, especially minimum wage people, the remaining workers would harbor resentment against that boss. And that would cause reduced productivity and an unhappy work environment for workers and the boss. By the way, I'm going to extend to two minutes your, each of your responses because I'm, this is such a complicated question. You'll each have two minutes to respond to this one. Six, if since every employer in a nationwide, if we raise the minimum wage nationwide, every employer would be required to pay the new minimum wage, all employers could then raise their prices to customers accordingly. So as a result, no employer would suffer a competitive disadvantage for doing that. I mean, it wouldn't put many out of business. Very few businesses operate on such tight margins that if you're paying their small, their, their minimum wage workers, those that are currently making 5.15 an hour, that making, paying them 7.25 an hour would put them out of business. Seven, inertia. Without a compelling reason, most people, employers, all of us, we simply don't change things. Sometimes even when it's to our detriment, we kind of just stay doing the same thing. And finally, especially now, when the American economy is near full employment, an unemployment rate of 4.6 to 4.8 percent, of course not counting discouraged workers, but we still have near full employment, it won't be easy to find a better worker. So most employers are going to simply stay with who they have. So that's my argument for why I think we're not going to see this vast increase in unemployment among the low-income workers if we indeed raise the minimum wage. Walter Block, you have two minutes to respond to that, and then Jared, you'll have two minutes. Well, I want to get back to my elevator operator because I think that's crucial. <clears throat> in the uh, minute or the day or the week right after the minimum wage went from 40 to 75 percent, not a single solitary elevator operator was fired. And then what happened is that uh, here you had an a inelastic demand curve in effect. And then what happened is little bit by little bit over the next six months, eight months, ten months, uh, over two, three, four years, every last elevator operator virtually was fired, except maybe in a museum they keep one just to show what it was like. The point is you have to be very careful with this. It's sort of like the Pythagorean theorem. Even though it's a, a logical necessity, it's not that clear. And I certainly disagree with Jared's point about the, his econometric or empirical studies. What he's failing to do is hold ceteris paribus conditions. Obviously, something else changes. Now, when economists try to take these uh, other things into account, they do an econometric regression equation. And the overwhelming evidence, Card and Kruger, uh, to the contrary, and they've been blasted away in, in the uh, literature, is that... Um, the minimum wage law creates uh, unemployment. The more unemployment, the higher the minimum wage law. And, and Jared, uh, sudden, uh, for some reason, hasn't uh, responded to my point about the $10,000 minimum wage. Look, um, uh, he, he, uh, let me get, now let me uh, talk about some of the, uh, the points that you made. Uh, the first point, we're near full employment. It won't be easy to find a better worker. What happens is that everyone's going to want to find a better worker because if you raise the minimum wage law to, say, $10 an hour, not 10000 just $10 an hour, uh, the workers who, whose, whose marginal revenue product or productivity is below $10 an hour, they're going to be uh, fired. And everyone is going to want to have a, a, a productivity worker who's got 11 or $12 an hour. It's very similar to what happens with affirmative action for blacks. Uh, when you have affirmative action for blacks, it's very hard to fire uh, a black. Uh, you're accused of racism, what have you. Uh, without that, you might give a black a chance who you don't think is going to succeed. But everyone wants a Harvard black. And what it does is it raises the uh, wages of the high productive people and not the low people. I'm sorry I only got to one out of your seven points, but I'm doing my best. I, you know what? I think I, could offer, I think I feel right about offering more flexibility. Would you like to have one more minute and I'll give Jared one more minute? Sure. Why Please not? do. Take another minute. Okay. Uh, let me talk just a little bit uh, about Walmart. Uh, Walmart has recently come out in favor of the minimum wage and also I want to talk about unions. 
Walmart has um, recently come out in favor of the minimum wage because for some of the reasons you mentioned, Walmart is not going to go broke if they have to pay an extra buck or two. But the people with whom they're competing, the small guys, they will go out of, uh, out of business or they'll be more likely to, to go out of business uh, under this. So a much better way for Walmart to compete, or they think so, is not through the marketplace, although they do pretty well, but they want every benefit they can get and now they're pushing for the minimum wage to uh which will negatively impact their com small competitors much more than it'll nev negatively impact them it's similarly like pushing for more paperwork they have um economies of scale and paperwork and if everyone has to do more paperwork it hurts the uh, the uh the small guy now take unions no, we're gonna, uh, okay i'll take unions I in think a so minute. Take, you'll have another chance sure okay uh jared bernstein you've got three minutes to respond to what uh, what i said and more importantly what walter black said okay uh first of all let me point out one very important area where walter is um factually incorrect and i think uh the most misleading thing he's said uh, which is this notion that Card and Kruger have been blasted away. Now, that sounds obscure. These are two economists who did path-breaking research on, uh, on minimum wage. Again, their work was an empirical analysis of the impact of minimum wages. I'll get to your points, Marty, uh, although I probably, uh, uh, probably Walter would need to address them more than I, because I think they, <laughs> they're good points. But let me put them in context. Um, Card and, and Kruger uh, did something that's rear, uh, rare in empirical economics and something that... Uh, 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 other economists like myself have followed up on. Um, they took advantage of the fact that uh, about 60% of the workforce now lives in, in states or areas with higher minimum wages than the federal. States have raised their minimum wage, including this state of California, um, because the federal uh, government's been uh, a laggard in that regard. That gives us the opportunity to look at before and after studies comparing, ceteris paribus, that is all else equal, comparing two places that uh, look the same in, in pretty much every way we can estimate, yet one had a higher minimum wage than the other. These kind of pseudo-experiments are rare in economics, and they give us an opportunity to really test the empirical effects, and they found uh, that, in fact, uh, higher minimum wages had no measurable disemployment effects, nothing at all like Walter is suggesting. Uh, another incorrect uh, point he made was that I didn't address his $10,000. I did. I said it's over the top. A moderate minimum wage increase simply isn't going to have the job loss effects that Walter predicts for many of the reasons that you gave, uh, uh, Marty, but also uh, a whole set of other reasons having to do with inefficiencies in the job market that a higher minimum wage actually addresses. Uh, it is a good question. How do employers absorb this higher minimum wage? Why are these empirical studies consistently finding this outcome? And by the way, here's a quote from Bob Solo, Nobel laureate economist, uh, far greater credentials than either of us. Um, the Cardin Kruger study, quote, provided evidence that went against the common view. It changed the way many economists look at the minimum wage. Joseph Stiglitz, another Nobel Prize winning economist. Credentials, you know, if you're looking for credentials, these guys got them. Uh, the social consequences of raising the wage have become increasingly important. We saw no ripple effect at all in the unemployment r r rate, as uh, Stiglitz says. Uh, so uh, the evidence has convinced those economists who are willing to look at it with an open mind. And I'm afraid I, I would have to not place Walter in that camp. Okay. Uh, what I, I think this study, this, this Card-Kruger study, sounds like it's pretty central and pretty major. So what I'd like you to do, um, why don't we, Walter, give you a chance to talk about it. I would imagine that you, you said, you know, you are clearly have... You think the Card and Kruger study is absurd. You say it was blown out of the water. He thinks it's it's golden. Let's spend a little more Robert time taking. Solo, not me. I'm sorry. What? I'm saying Robert Solo thinks that, not just me. Okay, but let's give let's take another minute. Why don't you take 60 seconds to to explain Walter why you think the Card and Kruger study is should you know is is garbage and and uh, Jerry, you'll get another minute to say why you think it's not. Uh, the reason it's garbage, first of all, on Stiglitz, uh, Stiglitz did win a Nobel Prize, and they ought to take it away from him for malpractice. Uh, if you look at his textbook that he wrote before he won the Nobel Prize, he has the mainstream view on minimum wage, namely he says it's just uh, idiotic, and it hurts, uh, idiotic if you think it helps the poor. Uh, the Cardin Kruger study uh, is just uh, not worth the paper it's printed on. Uh, other people went back and tried to replicate uh, what they did, and they were unable to do it. Namely, their empirics were all wrong. And even if somehow it was true, you see, I'm giving a better case. I'm giving the elevator operators. There are cases where, when the minimum wage uh, law rises, there are no uh, unemployment effects whatsoever. As I say, it took three or four years to get rid of all those elevator operators and put in automatic elevators. If the Cardin-Kruger people would have done it then, they would have said, aha, see, 
Well, the point is that elasticity changes over time. Short-run elasticities are very inelastic. The more time you give to, for elasticity to work or for people to adjust, the more unemployment effects you'll have. And then... People started saying, well, the reason we had uh, automatic elevators is, you know, uh, interest rates or some other thing. But it was the minimum wage. And this is something that the uh, the Cardin Krugers of the world or the Stiglitz or the Solos or my esteemed colleague here, Jared, uh, just refused to see. Okay, do you want to comment on that? But he keeps, um, Walter keeps talking also. He uses that elevator example. I'd like you I, to resp guess, respond to that, look, to I mean, mention that in your response. You asked Walter very clearly to talk about what he didn't like about the Cardin Kruger study. And all he said is it can't be right. Uh, because it goes against my fundamental theory on this, and B, it's not worth the paper it's written on. I mean, he did not address what is wrong with this study, what's wrong with the sample, what's wrong with the econometrics, and the reason he didn't address it is because he can't. This study has been uh, peer-reviewed, held under great scrutiny, and let me tell you what Alan Blinder, another uh, very highly regarded vice chair of the Federal Reserve, okay, this is not a wild-eyed uh, uh, you know, radical, and he also wrote a textbook with the traditional view, and then he changed his view. My thinking on this has changed dramatically. The evidence appears to be against the simple-minded theory that a modest increase in the minimum wage causes substantial job loss. I mean, for Walter, this is like a religion, and he can't simply get past the simple-minded theory by looking at the empirical evidence or criticizing it in any meaningful way, other than to say it can't be right, it's worthless. I, you know what? Well, I want you, I'm going to give Walter 30, some, you know, th 30 more seconds. Do you add, can you criticize the the Card and Kruger study on its on the on the methodology? Yes, I did. I said uh, they, it couldn't be replicated. Their empirical work was tried to. It, it, one of the essences of all science is can it be replicated by other scientists? And other scientists uh, try to replicate it and couldn't. Yeah. Uh, second point is that the, the time period was off. The, as with regard to the elevator operator, if you take the uh, thing uh, one minute or one day or one year after the um, uh, law changes, you won't find the effects. But if you take it three or four or five years, you will find more and more and more effects. Also, there have been surveys of economists. You see, he's quoting two or three people in a name-dropping manner. But there have been formal surveys of economists and you get like 96% of economists will agree that a minimum wage law, uh, whether it's increased or just w at whatever level, will increase or uh, create unemployment for low-skilled workers. Yeah. Now, back in, 19, in the 1970s, Walter was right. It was about 90% of economists agreed. Now, uh, the most recent survey in the mid-90s, it was down to 45%. So you need to update that, uh, that view. Secondly... Um, no, Card and Kruger themselves replicated their study. Uh, others, uh, including myself, replicated their study. Lots of folks have replicated that study, so that's false also. Now, let's talk about your elevator operators. I know you want to get to that, and I think it's a great example. Basically, the notion there is that we should keep minimum wages low enough so that firms uh, have an incentive to hire lots of uh, low-wage labor and, 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 an, and an incentive not to invest in, uh, in labor-saving capital. Uh, and I would disagree with that. Uh, to me, that's kind of like let's make sure uh, our uh, low wages are, you know, at, at levels that are, are that are probation level, so that employers will just uh, have no incentive to agree, uh, invest in capital. And I think that's a mistake. And I think we've actually seen that increases in the minimum wage have been in, absorbed in lots of different ways. And one of those ways is a more productive work site, in part due to capital investment, but also due to some of the savings that occur when you raise the minimum wage. You tend to have fewer vacancies. You tend to have a more productive workforce. You tend to have uh, l less absenteeism. You tend to have uh, a, a less difficult time hiring workers. You tend to have less turnover. Um, we certainly saw this in the most recent increase in the latter 90s, uh, a, a period followed by a, a real, uh, a very important uh, acceleration in productivity growth. There's lots of ways to absorb a higher minimum wage, and it's not simply through disemployment. That's why we don't find the job loss effects. Okay. Productivity, uh, pro uh, and, uh, and, and not to mention profits. Okay, let's talk about it. wage is redistributed. Walter Block, what about the, 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 his argument that actually raising the minimum wage increases productivity? Well, this is the efficiency wage doctrine, and if it's true, you don't need a minimum wage. People will raise wages on their own, like you raise the wages of your uh, worker here to get more efficiency out of her. Look, if the minimum wage law is so great, why do we need exceptions for it? Why do we need exceptions for teenagers? During the summer, uh, everyone and his uncle is saying, well, hire a teen, hire a teen, and nobody's hiring a teen because the teen
teens' productivity is below the minimum wage. So what they do then is they have a, an exception. They say, okay, the te- uh, the minimum wage law for uh, everyone else is 515, but for teens it'll be three or four. Why do they have to have an exception for handicapped people? Handicapped people couldn't get a job. Mentally handicapped people couldn't get a job if they had to be paid 515. If the if the law is so bloody in favor in helping uh, the poor, why do they have to have exceptions for it? Well, I think that the the reason you you have to have exceptions is because there are exceptions within the job market. Uh, I I agree that uh, uh, there may that the low productivity of some workers uh, would certainly uh, warrant uh, their being paid less than the minimum wage. So you carve out an exception for those folks. Basically, the market sometimes fails at setting an appropriate wage. It fails in an economic sense, and it certainly fails in a social sense. And here's a way in which I think the minimum wage is, is as much a social policy as it is an economic policy. If Walter had his way, and, I, and I, I'd like to hear him address this, if Walter had his way and the market drove the wage of a worker down to 25 cents an hour, Walter, to be uh, logically consistent, would have to say that's absolutely fine. That's what the market says. That's okay. That's what that worker is worth. Congress doesn't believe it. I don't believe it. And by the way, about 80% of the public doesn't believe it either. So you have to be willing to sometimes step in and correct a social inequity in the market uh, that will push wages down to a probation level. For adult workers, you know, 70% of people affected by this minimum wage increase are adults. These are not just kids. Well, I think you've given the game away once you uh, uh, allow exceptions, because if it's so bloody good, why do you need exceptions? The point is you're operating on this fallacious notion that the minimum wage is a floor which raises wages. If it were true, why do you have to have exceptions? Why is is 10,000 uh, over the top? And talk about 25 cents an hour. In some third world underdeveloped countries where they have sweatshops with Kathy Lee Gifford and Nike and all that, that's what the wage is. Okay, so that, the, the, reason that, the reason that the wage is 25 cents an hour is because of low productivity. So and right the right reason right that right they right had... Right. Well, hold yeah, on, hold on. Know, I didn't interrupt you, so uh, yeah. please don't interrupt me. I know. Marty is our referee and you have to abide by what he says. Okay. He just can't keep interrupting oh. me, so let me finish my point. Finish In these third world countries, if you imp- and we did this once in Puerto Rico for some screwy reason because Puerto Rico is part of the country, but Puerto Rico is very different than most states. And uh, in Puerto Rico, what they did is temporarily raise the minimum wage to U.S. mainland levels, and they created devastating unemployment. So th- this is just. Uh, there's nothing wrong with 25 cents an hour if that's what the productivity is. And, and no, let me rephrase that. I, I'm against that. I wish uh, uh, productivity was higher. But given that the productivity is higher, uh, lower in these third world countries because of uh, low capital and, and less free enterprise, which uh, Jared uh, would, uh, would obviously favor, you're not going to do anyone a favor if you go to uh, Guyana or Peru or anywhere like that and raise the minimum wage law to 515. You'll just unemploy all of them, just as if you'd employ all of them with 10,000. What's this? Over the top crap. J- uh, Jared, your response, please. Sure. Um, I think, although it was uh, a- a- extremely muffled, uh, I think Walter just agreed with my assertion that he would accept the 25 cent an hour wage in, in the United States if that what the market dictated. Uh, I think he should. I think he should, to be logically consistent, have the courage of his convictions to step forward and say, "Yes, Jared, I agree. That's right. If that's what the market says." That's absolutely appropriate. Yes, Jared, I agree. That's absolutely appropriate. And the okay. people the people who would be getting okay, 25 cents an hour you, would be people who are mentally handicapped. Okay. And better that they get the 25 cents an hour that they get nothing, which I you would get them if you. they, uh, okay. if you didn't, uh, if you passed the minimum wage law. Sure. Uh, In other okay. words, if their productivity Jared was talking. Is... i, I got to let Jared. Please okay. continue, sure. Jared. I mean, okay. he's 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 he's, he's agreed to your assertion. Would you respond now to his assertion? He's He's basically saying that there are people who would get be getting zero. I mean, there are people in this society who right now can't even get a volunteer job, who can't uh, who can't get an internship because they're perceived as having zero net value to the employer. So, are you saying that we as a society need to income redistribute apart from the apart from their economic value to make sure that teenagers, uh, other people who are perceived? I, think, I, I don't really. Ag- I mean, I, oh, I don't totally disagree with that. I mean, there is disagree with what? Let's get it clear. Okay. There are uh, there's a sub you, there's a sub minimum wage for youth workers. I'm not talking. I think for disability, it's a different story. Well, wait, hold on a second. There are so many categories of people who are currently very often as and in the aggregate not perceived as earning no, no, deserve. No, no. Hold me finish. Right. Let me finish. Let that. me finish. I, I'm willing to talk about two subgroups. Hold on. Let me finish. There are groups who, as a group, are uh, groups that in the aggregate are have disproportionate numbers of people who are not who the free market would not pay a minimum wage to teenagers, low income African Americans, 
mm -hmm. the mentally disabled, the physically disabled, uh, ma people with a, a, a whole variety of you know, people who wouldn't be officially defined as, as mentally disabled but who don't show up on time routinely. Would you call for... Uh, Absolutely. for differential wages not for not those protect not those groups i would i i would sign off on a sub youth minimum wage i would i would possibly sign off on on a wage for severe a, a, a sub minimum wage for severely disabled workers as a kind of subsidy in order to help those folks uh, uh, integrate into the labor market. That's the only group. You talk about low-income African Americans, what the heck do we know about their productivity growth rate? Here's, I mean, their productivity contributions. I mean, here is Walter's assumption that uh, these folks are being paid their, quote, marginal product. They're being paid what they're worth. And damn it, if the market says they're worth 25 cents, and that's what they're worth. I think that's absolutely wrong, and that's why we have a minimum wage on Let me ask you a question. Which would you rather have, zero or 25 for the people whose productivity is 25 Five cents an I'd hour. Have a minimum wage floor, no, 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 no. Just answer my question. Just answer my. Just answer my bloody question. Just answer my question. I answered your question, but you're not answering my question. How about answering my question? My question is, which would you rather have, zero or twenty-five cents for people whose productivity okay, well, is twenty-five cents? I don't have to accept that ridiculous scenario. It's ridiculous. Oh, so you're not okay, answering well, my question? Stop. Okay, let it, uh, Jared respond as you feel is appropriate. Okay. Look, I haven't had. Give me, give me a minute here. After you've got a minute uninterrupted. I'll, I'll, I'll choke him. He's here in the studio. I'll choke him if he interrupts you. Okay. Look, it's such a ridiculously false dichotomy to set up this zero or twenty-five cents, or to start separating out low-income blacks, you know, as somehow uh, it, you know, undeserving of the minimum wage. This is exactly where um, the kind of theoretical religious notions that Walter is promoting here get us in this debate. You simply, the, the minimum wage is not a complicated idea. The idea is that we will block, we will actually uh, 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 put a floor on the, uh, on the wage levels that the job market uh, offers to workers, to the, our least advantaged workers. Now, we do that for social reasons and we do that for economic reasons. The social reasons are that we're not going to allow the market to drive wages to probation levels. You would not want to do that if it actually hurt people's employment opportunities, if Walter was right. But Walter is wrong. And there are reams of excellent quality pseudo-experimental research that show this, that if moderate increases in the minimum wage, and we've seen it, and I've cited Nobel laureates, not advocates on either side of the issue, Nobel laureates who look at this issue and whose views have changed based on this superior evidence, and therefore... Uh, you know, to argue that you should have zero minimum wage at 25 cents is, uh, I think, uh, uh, just basing uh, uh, your view on a, a religion that's uh, that's been discredited. Okay, that's a minute. Now, I, have a, I do have a question for you. I, it, as a non-economist, Walter, I just... It's scary to me. I mean, I well know that there are people who in Asia are willing to work for 30 cents an hour. There are people, highly skilled people in India, are willing to work for $5 an hour. It simply, as a human being, it frightens me to think that you're calling for no minimum wage and in fact in a world economy where you can offshore a lot and you can automate a lot it scares me to think that human beings i don't care who they are would be not earning a wage where they can afford basic health care they can afford basic housing basic food it scares the heck out of me I mean, as a human being reassure me why i shouldn't be so scared oh no you should be scared and i'm scared too and i don't but he much like it. And the reason for it is you don't have free enterprise. The reason we have such uh, a standard of living here is we have a, a, not a laissez-faire economy, but we have a closer to free enterprise economy than uh, places like India or other underdeveloped countries. And Jared is trying to uh, uh, disembody or take away the free enterprise elements that we've got. Look, uh, he refused to answer the zero versus 25 uh, cents question. He uh, he conceded the whole point when he has a sub-minimum wage, because if the minimum wage is supposed to be raising people why are we being so niggardly with teenagers now let me just mention unions i mentioned unions a while seconds, ago or 20 seconds, uh, sorry. the main proponents apart from walmart and big companies that are going to steal a march on small companies are unions when the union raises their wages uh the employer natural tendency is to substitute out of the suddenly more expensive factor of production, namely skilled union workers, and into the suddenly relatively cheaper uh, factor of production, namely unskilled workers, because you can make products with uh, different proportions. And uh, the unions don't like that. Now, in the good old days, or the bad old days, what they would do is they beat up the scabs. But now they're becoming more white-collar. 
What they do is they get Teddy Kennedy and, and his ilk, and they say, let's raise the minimum wage so the employer won't have the uh, incentive or opportunity better to uh, fire or uh, resist the union wage and instead substitute uh, low-skilled workers who happen to be predominantly or disproportionately black or Puerto Rican or, or Mexican or what have you. So this is a, a very racist sort of a thing that Jared is promoting. Uh, do you want to respond to that, Jared? Please, you have 60 seconds uninterrupted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, the workers who have benefited most from minimum wage increases have, of course, been our lowest wage workers. These are disproportionately women, about 60% of those who would be affected by a minimum wage increase up to 725 are, are women. <clears throat> They're disproportionately minority. And by the way, if you actually poll this thing, if you ask people who, uh, whether they support the minimum wage, it polls at around 80%. But if you talk to the actual beneficiaries of a higher minimum wage, they're all for it. Now, somehow, um, you know, Marty thinks he knows the low-wage labor market better than they, but uh, the, they, they recognize that a higher minimum wage simply means that their paychecks are going to be a slight bit fatter. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, uh, impinge on their employment opportunities one bit. In fact, Marty himself said that uh, it takes years for the disemployment effects that he envisions, not that the research shows, but that his... Wait, w Marty or Walter? I'm sorry, Walter. Yeah, that, yeah, I was wondering. Sorry, that Wal you know, Wal Walter's ideology on this reflects not the empirical research. So, in fact, uh, you know, he himself has, has uh, acknowledged that we're talking about uh, two or three years of, of higher uh, minimum wages uh, um, before uh, capital replacements take place. And I have looked at, uh, at the research that looks at the long-term effects and does not find uh, anything like that kind of job loss. So, again, I think you've got to decide this thing not on ideology. You have to be like Alan Blinder, uh, former vice chair of the Federal Reserve, who said, my view was changed. He wrote a textbook with the conventional wisdom, then he looked at the newer research and changed his mind. And I, I just would importune uh, uh, Walter to, to take a, a much closer look at that research than he has with much more objective eyes. I think he's far too ready to reject this stuff. All right, hold on. Jared, I, I, I don't want to hear any more ad hominem. <laughs> you know, we've got that. But I want to ask you a question. Um, the full cost of a minimum wage employee is a lot higher than the wage itself. I mean, there's employer social security, there is workers' comp, which it's in itself could be, in, especially in California, up to 50% of wages, plus mandated, mandated paid holidays. So if, if we raise the minimum wage to 725, that would make the actual cost of a, of that employee, eleven bucks an hour, twelve bucks an hour. I mean, that's twenty thousand dollars a year. Aren't there millions of minimum wage workers who simply don't add twenty thousand dollars a year of value to their employer's business? In fact, I mean, many employers say that their lowest wage workers are often just a necessary pain. They're unreliable. They're low skilled. They learn slowly. Isn't it possible that Walter's right that raising the minimum wage would cause great unemployment among our most vulnerable people, like legal residents, illegals, immigrants, etc.? Let me be clear about this. I mean, I, I totally agree. I started where Walter is. I mean, I totally agree that everything he's saying is possible and plausible. And in fact, based on the theory, he's right. Uh, it's the, uh, but it's the actual, occur you know, the actual empirical outcomes that have interested me and changed my view about this. I started where he is. And, and, and it is interesting that the, uh, given what you just said, Marty, that the evidence shows what it shows. Now, I think one of the reasons is that those are fixed costs, and employers' decisions tend to be made at the margins. So really what they're reacting to here is, the, is not the uh, whatever you know, X dollar change you're referring to, given those fixed costs that are already in play, but it's the difference between the old wage and the new wage. Okay. What I'm going to do now is we're going to bring it to a conclusion. I'm going to give you each 90 seconds to summarize what you think in the clearest English for those of us who are not economists, who are just plain old intelligent listeners. Make your best case in 90 seconds for why you think, we'll start with you this time, Jerry, since I started with Walter sure. at the beginning, why you think the minimum wage should be raised in 90 seconds. Please begin. All right. First of all, uh, let me apologize for getting uh, heated and uh, interrupting because that doesn't help. Understandable. Anything. You know, we are two very smart guys, passionate and well-intentioned, hey, and it's understandable. You guys have been terrific. Continue. And I, and I, I apologize to Walter because, uh, uh, hello? Yeah. I apologize to Walter because uh, he clearly has a thoughtful view on this, and I didn't mean to uh, get heated. Um, look, I understand that if you raise the price of something, people uh, will buy less of it in theory. Uh, however, uh, for lots of reasons, um, apparently increases in the minimum wage don't have that effect. Now, we have had 19 increases in the federal minimum wage. 
We have 20 states with higher minimum wages. We have 100 cities with higher living wages. We have had tremendous opportunities, more than almost any other area of empirical economics, to test the impact of this wage increase. And what we found is here is a moderate policy that actually does what it's supposed to do. It actually raises the earnings of low-wage workers a little bit without hurting the likelihood that they're going to find work. I think that's a plain English defense of a policy and a relatively small policy that maybe would affect about, oh, six, eight million people in the labor force, a labor force of 140 million if we raise the minimum wage. It's a small way in which we help uh, offset a market that fails to provide a decent wage for those at the very bottom, and it's a step we ought to take. We've taken it many times before, and in moderation, it's a successful policy. I urge those who oppose this based on ideology to, to take a much closer look at the actual outcomes and see what it does. Uh, rare in uh, public policy, here's, an, here's a simple fix uh, for a simple problem uh, that works. Walter Block, 90 seconds. Summarize your views. Why we should, your position is we should not raise the minimum wage. In fact, you think we should not have a minimum wage at all. 90 seconds in plain English that us mere plebs can understand. Why should we not have a minimum wage, let alone raise the minimum wage? My main uh, opposition is that it's profoundly anti-black and profoundly anti-teen and profoundly anti-handicapped people. And these people are at the low end of the pyramid. The Catholic bishops have this uh, uh, notion, the preferential option for the poor, the way we as a society will be judged is how we treat the poor. Because if, the, if we really mess with the poor, they have uh, very few resources upon which to fall. Uh, if we mess with the middle class, they can just become poor and they can still stay alive. The teenage unemployment rate is uh, two to three times the unemployment rate of adults because adults have a higher productivity. The black unemployment rate is uh, two to three times higher than the white productivity because blacks have lower productivity than whites for various historical reasons that I won't get into. So uh, people like unions and Walmart and Jared and all these left-wing Nobel uh, economists, what they're doing really is attacking the people who are the least and the lost and the last among us. These are the people who are most at risk. He's really conceded the point when he says that he'll uh, allow a um, a teen exception. He, it, why would he allow a teen exception? I mean, if the minimum wage law will raise teens' productivity and raise their wages, why have an exception for them at three dollars an hour? This is niggardly. I mean, you don't have to go to ten thousand an hour. Although I am very fond of that point, but uh, just why have a teen exception? Because. The poor teens. Let them uh, earn $5 an hour if it's going to help them, but it's not going to help them. All it does is unemploy them. Better to make 25 cents an hour than zero. Thank you both. Um, I have been, it's been a real honor to have both of you as a, a guest on the show. Let me uh, let people know if you would like to uh, read a, uh, a book that is not specifically on the minimum wage, but is a, a much broader look at the kind of um, I think is well articulated a position for the liberal view on how to change our economy, but not a radical view, but a, 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 a pretty standard liberal view. It is a new book by Jared Bernstein, who is a director of the Economic Policy Institute in D.C. The book is called All Together Now, Common Sense for a Fair Economy. And Walter Block, if there was one thing that you would like your, my listeners, to read of yours that would help them more broadly you're a libertarian by by persuasion in general. What would what would be the one thing of your? You've written a dozen books, many articles. What would be the one thing you would most like my listeners to read? Uh, the best introduction to economics is Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. My book is the second best. It's called Defending the Undefendable, and it's an available on Amazon. I want to profoundly thank you both. <clears throat> thank you so much for giving me a very stressful, instead of a nice, easy, relaxing Sunday, a very stressful Sunday morning. I wish you certainly both all of the best. Thank you. And it is now my pleasure to introduce my frequent co-conspirator on this show, <laughs> who's looking befuddled. Maybe this was all economic stuff over her head and has no clue what's going on. That's the look on her face but she's the, I mean she if anybody should I mean she's not your average person she's not only the Napa County superintendent of schools she won the award last year for the superintendent of the year, of the year over a hundred other people Dr. Barbara Nemco what is your uh, la intelligent layperson's reaction to this debate on whether we should raise the minimum wage well of course the liberal side of me who wants everyone to have a good life says we should raise the minimum wage for people who aren't working, the government finds ways to pay them anyway. Uh, so 
it's kind of, are we taking it out of the left-hand pocket or the right-hand pocket? And people who can't afford, who aren't working at all, are getting some kind of assistance and they're getting health care. And so we are paying it. It would make sense to pay it and have people at least have some sense of a contribution than just a giveaway. That's a very interesting point. If we have no minimum wage, our I believe relatively humane government is not going to allow these people to starve on the streets. If there's no minimum wage, and let's say there are people that are making, you know, uh, 25 cents an hour, the government would subsidize with food stamps as we do, and health subsidize health care, etc. So it's then going to simply the the cost of those what what are described as marginal workers will be picked up by the general taxpayer. And with an increase in the minimum wage, what that means is that subsidization beyond what their economic real value is in the marketplace, we paid for by the employers. So it's a matter really of whether we want that, 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 that subsidy to come just from the employers, which is, that's the liberal point of view, uh, who would rather, you know, tax the employers, which ultimately would make American employers less competitive in the world marketplace, or do we take the liberty or the more conservative point of view, which is to let the cost of these workers who, for whom the market cannot support on their own, would be paid by all the taxpayers? Is that what you're basically saying? Yeah, that sounds good. I think that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, you said it better. Yeah. What I really find interesting is, I mean, I think the the argument ended up hinging on the issue of the theoretical versus the empirical. Theories can't, by definition, encompass everything, all the factors that are at play in the world. In theory, to the best that we can understand it, Walter Block, I believe, is absolutely right. It would make sense that in with a if we raise the minimum wage or any minimum wage, what we're going to eventually do is we're going to price the lowest, the workers who offer the least value to to an employer out of the market and yet I am ultimately convinced by empiricism just like we can make create theories and models about stock prices and which should go up and which should go down but the collective wisdom of the marketplace dictates what the true value of a stock is some stock Pro procrastinate pro prognosticator who's got 37 variables and a multiple regression equation can say this fair price for this stock should be forty dollars but that's that pales in comparison with what the collective wisdom of the market does when they decide that stock is priced currently at 50. In theory, Walter's argument makes a lot of sense to me. But I look at, and as, as Jared said, we look at every one of the increases in the minimum wage. There have been 10 over the last, since the minimum wage was introduced early in the 20th century. There have been, a, I don't know what he said, 11 increases in the minimum wage. And while correlation certainly does not e equal causation, it has not certainly resulted in the massive dislocation of low-income workers that would have been predicted by the model. And so, because the thought of having no minimum wage and therefore having workers working at 25 or 50 cents an hour is just somehow, apart from the economics, somehow such a symbol of what would be a, seen as a draconian and non-humanistic society. I feel that especially since the increases in the minimum wage have not caused this vast increase in unemployment, I think almost as a symbol of our commitment to relative egalitarian, relative, rel not, we don't want to be a banana republic where you have the small number of people who are worth millions and millions of dollars and you've got people in dire poverty, I think there is at least, almost for, like Jared said, from a sociological perspective, a need to have a, an ostensible minimum wage that at least makes the public feel that there is some sense of egalitarianism, less we do devolve into civil war, Barbara Nemco. Whoa. Um, I, I can't even begin to respond to all of that, but if you look at the fact that we do offshore all jobs that we can for lower paid workers, the fact that we import all kinds of stuff because of the very low uh, wage rates in third world countries, uh, every employer is always looking for the lowest paid employee that he can get what we ought to be doing it seems to me is and god knows i'm no economist 
but we are losing the whole work ethic in this country. We're, we're almost becoming a society that feels so entitled. We feel entitled to our highest standard of living in the world. Everybody feels that they're entitled to have their parents' standard of living without recognizing that it may have taken their parents 30 or 40 years to get there. Um, we need to be making the lowest paid workers more productive so that they could legitimately uh, earn and demand a salary that's higher. But how can we ever expect that we have a large number of people? We know you and I who deal who have in the, in the past, because I dealt with education, you deal with it every day. There are some people, no matter how much you train them, no matter how much you, they are going to provide low marginal utility. We are, you know, as we see, we are in the genomic age, and we see that we who we are is function of both of our genes and our environment. There are some folks who simply are not very bright. They don't learn very well. And their their reliability is not just something you can teach somebody. Some people just don't have this drive thing. Can, I'm not sure that we can train our way into being uh, competitive, where those workers can be competitive with people in countries who are, who are smart and hardworking and well-educated who are willing to work for a dollar an hour. Can we really train our way out of this issue? Perhaps not, but then you're going to pay them through government subsidies. That's right. and you're I not going to let them starve on the streets. And I think we have to. I think I, I think that is exactly right. Uh, but what what will, what worries me a little bit now, taking Walter's side for a minute, if we do raise a minimum wage and to uh, to a, let's say living wage here in the Bay Area, it's eleven dollars an hour plus fifty percent for benefits, sixteen dollars an hour. How will the companies that are required to pay unskilled labor sixteen dollars an hour? How could they survive in a global marketplace where there are companies who are paying, who are, let's say, based in or do, do a lot of their manufacture in China or, or Vietnam or, or in Central America, who are paying 50 cents an hour? Won't those companies go out of business sooner, probably rather than later, in this ever faster paced global economy where the economic impacts of, of such economic changes would occur more rapidly than they did 50 years ago? Won't we have, as Walter is claiming, Zero, you know, all those companies will be out of business and all of their employees will be making zero. But the proposal was not to raise it to an actual uh, required wage. Even Nobody's if it's talking about seven twenty-five, seven twenty-five an hour plus fifty percent of a minute, eleven dollars an hour in in Vietnam, they've got workers who are willing to work for thirty cents an hour. If we are forcing employers to pay eleven bucks an hour for all of their lower level workers. How can they possibly compete on price? Every customer is going to want to buy something that's, you know, it's not like a little difference. Thirty cents an hour Vietnam cost of for, to pay workers, eleven dollars an hour here. How can in the world is America? That's pardon the pun. Is America American companies going to survive? Why aren't we going to have massive one big nation of unemployment as we insist in this theoretical ideal that we should pay everybody a quote living wage? Yes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yes, that's true. We got a couple of minutes. I'm curious. Is the, we're going to have time to take basically one call, maybe two calls? If somebody has got an intelligent, thoughtful response to this that hasn't been already made, that's a new perspective. You, my dear listeners, I would invite you to call now and share that perspective. The phone number here at work with Marty Nemco on the question, should we've had this wonderful debate with Walter Block, a leading libertarian economist, and Jared Bernstein, a leading liberal economist. But And now Barbara and I have given our reactions, but I'd like to at least give you guys a chance to have a comment or two. The phone number here at work with Marty Nemco, do you think the minimum wage should be raised or not? 415-841-4134. That's 415-841-4134. While we're waiting for the calls to go, go ahead, Bob, you were Well, I was just thinking, when I was working with a sixth grade class and we were doing, um, one, like, junior achievement, we were looking at all the clothing that we wear and what we have in our homes, and there was almost nothing made in America. Uh, when I actually looked at the labels in my clothing, it comes from Turkey, it comes from Mexico, it comes from China, everything in my house comes from Japan and Korea, and I wasn't even aware of that. So, yes, the, the public buys lower cost items without caring about the fact that it means that a lot of American workers are not working and they're not making a decent wage. All our lines are lighted up instantly. Let's go right to the phones. Welcome to work with Marty Nemco and Barbara Nemco. You are on the air. Is it me? It is you. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to say was uh, this uh, uh, currently discussed change in the minimum wage to 725, as I understand it, is essentially just adjusting for inflation. Mm-hmm. What the minimum wage was raised to in 1996-97. 
So we're not really talking about a real increase in the minimum wage. Good point. We're talking about keeping the minimum wage at what it was in 19... Legitimate point. You know what? I want to get as many perspectives as I can. Good point. Thank you for the call. Let's go back to the phones. Welcome to work with Marty and Barbara. You are on the air. Hi, this is Ravi. Hello, Ravi. Um, I think that um, raising the minimum wage doesn't necessarily mean that we are deciding that we want to cause unemployment, but as a society, we're deciding uh, what what level of where we want to put the the limit on on people's lifestyles. Um, and all other jobs should be going abroad if it can be made cheaper. Anyway, thank you for your call. Let's get another perspective. Uh, welcome to work with Marty Nemco and Barbara Nemco. You are on the air. I'd like to make an appointment. <laughs> the point about this $10,000 <laughs> analogy. Yeah, go ahead. And both sides agreed that $10,000 would cause massive unemployment. And then one guy said that minimal increases would not cause it. And I just wanted to say that nobody <clears throat> can really know where that is, and it differs for the different people, like different amounts of productivity. And and these are real lives being messed with. And also, it's not just a matter of numbers on employment. It's particular kinds of jobs. I mean, some people might be able to go out and sort of create their own job by offering to work for a small amount to get on the job training. And if the potential employer has to pay minimum wage, then that opportunity is lost to them. Okay, let's get another call. Welcome to work with Marty Nemco. You are on the air. Yeah, I think Jared Bernstein uh, missed a very valuable point when he was talking to Walter Block. Basically, this country did not have a minimum wage until the 20th century. What did we have before the minimum wage went into effect? We had plantation slavery and the Great Depression. Walter Block and all his ilk who are advocating no minimum wage, that is what they are advocating for. They want to take us backwards, not forward. I'm going to take these without, without comment. Welcome to, the, welcome to work with Marty Nemco and Barbara Nemco. You are on the air. Yes, um, I'd like to address Walter Bach, though he's not here, with two points. One is the fact, could he live on minimum wage or uh, living wage in San Francisco with his family? I'm going to interrupt you. You know, a number of the calls are making the same point. The point is, with, with a minimum wage, he is arguing that there will be ultimately people making nothing. He, that, that once you make, once you make an employer pay more than a person is worth Paying to on, on pure economic grounds, he's simply not going to hire him, well, and he's going to be unemployed. He's going to make CEOs. zero. Look how much they make per hour, and their le level of productivity is pretty frequently very poor. Yeah, and that's and I agree with that liberal side actually that there really is more cushion in there in the employer's pocket that they could indeed redistribute some of their money into the low-income person's pocket, pocket without going out of business. Let's take one more call, and then we got to go. Hello. Last call. Welcome to work with Marty Nemco, Barbara Nemco. You're on the air. Hi, I wanted to address the whole um, elevator operator thing. Perfect. Uh, um, the reason why that was eliminated, that position, is because technology right. improved to the point where they were com the position is com entirely unnecessary. Exactly, and that's the and that's the point. The point is that that Walter is making that is if we raise the minimum wage, we're going to create more circumstances where it's economically makes sense for an employer to say, you know, let's get rid of all these people. Let's have an automatic cotton gin let's have an automatic com let's use a computer let's use anything other than hire people if it's costing 11 bucks an hour but, but we've already done that yeah and 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 because they're look at all because the self-serve gas stations where it, anyway we've got to go i wanted to milk every minute i could of this show to get as many perspectives as i could thank you my dear listeners i want to again I don't, it's not quite pr grammatical I have profound thanks for both Walter Block and Jared Bernstein for extremely intelligent, thoughtful approaches to, to this thorny issue that seems common sense. Oh, sure, raise the minimum wage. There are two legitimate, intelligent sides of the view of the issue. This is what I believe radio should be all about. I want to thank you both. Thank you, Barbara Nemco, for coming in and, uh, and giving an intelligent layperson's perspective. And, of course, my dear listeners, thank you all for listening and sharing your perspectives. Uh, and that is work with Marty Nemco for this week. My thanks to my board operator, Joanne Marr, and, of course, all of you. Next Sunday, I will uh, do three-minute caller makeovers on callers, career makeovers. But Barbara Nemco will be back. We're going to talk about male bosses and female bosses. Recent studies are showing some fascinating findings about differences. Barbara and I are going to kick those ideas around, probably kick each other around a bit. <laughs> Until next Sunday, this is Marty Nemco reminding you that we find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't.
Marty Nemco's columns plus chapters from his book, Cool Careers for Dummies, are available free at martynemco.com. That's marty, N-E-M-K-O dot com. To speak with Marty about your career or about this program, call him at 510-655-2777. Join Marty again next Sunday morning at 11 for Work with Marty Namco on 91.7 KALW San Francisco.